Okay, guys, what's up? Welcome back to the Mastery Podcast. I am joined today by a gentleman uh, that I've followed for many years um, and uh, was one of the first education programs uh, with regards to nutrition that I got involved in. Uh, many of you will know uh, John Barardi. Many of you who are newer to the industry may not. And it's therefore a huge privilege of mine to uh, uh, bring John Barardi onto the podcast today. John, welcome. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me, Mark. I very much appreciate it. I've heard great things about you over the years. And when our mutual friend uh, Ben introduced us recently, I was really excited to have the opportunity to chat. No, well, I'm extremely grateful that you've uh, you know, given me and the listeners the opportunity to, uh, you know, to connect today. Uh, I am going back to kind of 2010 for me, uh, mm-hmm. when I actually did the Precision Nutrition Level 1. Awesome. Um, and uh, that was a game changer for me. And I'm going to tell you why. And I'd like to kind of, you know, delve a little, a little bit of the conversations before we further get into this. But I was struggling as a coach, as many people were, are today, with change. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just that simple word, sick and tired of no one changing. And that's how right. I ended up. That's how I ended up with, um, you know, f- just finding through, and we'll get into marketing a little bit later, precision nutrition, because that was a big kind of, that was a big USP really of, of kind of what you were looking at with the model. Um, mm-hmm. So I'd love to get into a bit of that later on. But before we kind of get into this, you've been, you've been around for a while now, uh, for quite a while. <laughs> um, but just to those, uh, those, the coaches that are listening to the, to the show, could you just give us a little bit of background about your journey, your career, um, and then we'll kind of move you on through the, the rest of this episode. Yeah. I mean, you know the full story. I know you've read my book where I talk about going way, way back to when I was a kid in high school and all the different things that led me to making the decisions that you know led me to where I am today. Um, so you can pick on any particular strings that you want uh, me to go a little bit deeper into. But for those who don't know who I am, you know, um, you know, I most known for founding Precision Nutrition. We started an early version of that called Science Link, which was prior to Precision Nutrition. That was around uh, 2001, uh, which I, which I often amuses me to think that was before most people had high speed internet. Um, yeah, we course. were yeah, yeah. we we started our first website on dial up. And uh, and Science Link was just an extension of what I was just passionately interested in at the time. I was a master's and a PhD student right around that time. And um, I was, you know, I, I got into this because I was a bodybuilder, you know, the discipline of bodybuilding and powerlifting had fundamentally changed my way of orienting to the world and what I thought about hard work and what I thought about what I could achieve as a human. And, um, and then I decided to turn you know, that laser onto academics. And so everything I was learning in school was all designed to help me with, you know, physical manipulation or whatever. And the clients that were turning to me for advice, because I was, I started out as a personal trainer when I was about 17. Um, So Science Link was this idea of translating research into results, right? So every, every day for my PhD work, I had to you know, read research papers and I was doing research in the lab, but most fascinating to me was not research for research sake, but how do we take, you know, what we're learning and translate it into, you know, athletic performance or, you know, physique manipulation or improvements in health. So, you know, a a full day a week, I would spend Thursdays. And again, this was before publications were on the web. Uh, in the stacks, which is like the bowels of the library at my university, you would go down to the deepest basement and there would be all the research publications. So the uh, January issue of the Journal of Applied Physiology would have just came out. And to nerds like me, you're like, oh, the new JAP is out. Mm-hmm. Let's meet at the library and read it together, <laughs> you know? And um, so then I would just be taking notes constantly. What could I share in an article? What could I bring to a client interaction? And so, you know, that was, you know, the science link sort of beginnings. Uh, And then a few years later, uh, precision nutrition sort of sprung from that, um, which really became, you know, it's gone on to become the world's largest coaching, you know, having coached over 200,000 clients now, 
uh, certification, so the education piece you talked about, and now software company, where it sort of connects the technology we built to coach clients at scale with the education so that coaches can basically coach, you know, using our proven scientifically validated curriculum with their clients, with them as the coach, you know? Mm -hmm. So that, that's really what PN became. Um, but, you know, you, you mentioned the change piece in there. You know, in the early days, it was science link. It was translating research into results. It's read research, figure out how to apply it. Read research, teach that research in lay person's language. Um, but a few years after, you know, and, and I'll tell you the story that was sort of the genesis of this insight, I was struggling with the same thing you were, you know, this idea of, gosh, the clients were really committed and disciplined or whatever. This is how I framed it in my mind. Um, get great results when they work with me. Mm -hmm. And then there's the rest, you know? Exactly. Uh, and, um, and there's only so long in your career, you can ignore eight out of 10 clients failing to have these marked jaw dropping, impressive transformations, right? Yeah. And many, many people do bury their head in the sand and they only focus on the two out of 10. Yep. You know, they're like, ah, oh, these two, or they spend the rest of their career trying to market and gather the kinds of people who have that level of drive and discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, but that even felt disingenuous to me too, because the people who need your help the most, you're excluding. And the people who will find a way to do it without you uh, are the ones you're hanging your success on. So it just became this, this turning point for me. And I realized I had to look outside of the Journal of Applied Physiology or the, the uh, biochemical and physiological texts for the answers to this. Mm -hmm. And that's when I started being introduced to behavioral psychology and change psychology and positive psychology and all these branches of psychology, which ironically are right next door. They're right next door to our field, but we never look at them. And they've already solved the riddle. You know, they have the answers to the problem we were all facing. Yeah. And so you didn't have to invent new knowledge. You just had to go, oh, how are those people dealing with the same exact problem? In almost a similar domain, it's, these are like cousins. Like for example, uh, if we're talking about nutrition coaching, we're talking about relationship with food, yep. you know, how people use food for emotional reasons or you know, a host of things related to eating habitual patterns. Um, well, psychology deals with, you know, alcoholism, addiction, right? Um, and so th there is a whole discipline helping people overcome chemical addiction. And I mean, uh, not to make light of it, but we're just talking about food changes. You know what I mean? So, wow, we could use those powerful technologies here. So that became the big pivot point for me and, and, and then a, a main driver, not ever leaving behind the biochemistry or, phys or the physiology, because that's important to the equation as well. Cool, cool. But if you, if uh, the person can't do what you're suggesting in the context of a real human life, then the biology doesn't matter. And, you know, I, I remember the day where it smacked me right in the face. You know, I was uh, invited to come work with the U.S. bobsled team at the time. This was many moons ago. And um, I showed up to give a lecture to this team. And these are you know, the US team was doing extremely well at the time. And uh, they had gone on to win a gold medal in 2010, just a couple of years later. And um, I remember, I was so excited to share all this cutting edge biochemistry, like, hey, we're going to tweak their supplements, and we'll just dial in their, uh, their physiology, their biochem, right, we're going to get that last 1%, right. I mean, because this is what this phrase is often kicked around in the supplement and even in the performance training world, which is, you know, at the margins at high, high level performance, 1% could be the difference between the gold medal and coming in last, of course. you know, right? So then, so the implication, the philosophical implication here is that we need to play in the margins when we go work with elite athletes. So this is what I believe. This is what I'd read. This is what I'd heard. Now I, now I have the opportunity. And so I made this like four hour PowerPoint presentation <laughs> with all these supplement. Well, oh, we're going to uh, tweak the rate of neural transmission across the uh, gap junctions, 
using this particular supplement because it's a inhibitor of the reuptake of a particular neurotransmitter. Oh, it's going to be amazing, guys. And so as I'm getting ready to deliver this, you know, 16 athletes walk in with bags of McDonald's. That's what they're going to eat while they're watching the nutrition and supplementation lecture. And I realized that I had created the wrong presentation, you know, and then that's when I realized, oh man, it's it, for a lot of elite athletes, we had to go back to basics, but even more than that, uh, these, these are patterns, right? This isn't just like, Hey, we're going to go to McDonald's today because we have a busy day and this meeting in between training sessions. This was the pattern of my life. Uh, it also has to do with the fact that bobsledders don't make much money. And so the, this is a cheap caloric option. These athletes have a tremendous training volume and load. Uh, they need a lot of calories and they need them cheap. And so the easiest thing to decide then is to get fast food, right? So then how do we help? And again, I call it the context of a real human life, right? Not, not a robot that should just take programming instructions from their omni, omniscient, omniscient coach, right? But um, a real human. So anyway, that's, that's a little bit of the, the tour of, of my career and some seminal moments for me. And you know, out of what you've said about, you know, looking at that side-by-side -side kind of psychology and, and change, from a coach's perspective, you, you touched on something that was really, really important. There's a lot of people are looking for that, 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 that two clients that's always going to get a result. But the mm -hmm. thing that was always rewarding to me was I know that people are coming to the gym for a result and I owe it to them to help them understand as much as I could around that behavioral journey and change. Because some of my best transformations ever were people that have been with me one to two years who had gone through this change journey. And I had supported, mm -hmm. I became fascinated with not necessarily just the person that comes in and says, right, we've got 12 weeks, let's get shredded. Yeah. I, I, I was fascinated by the person that came in and said, I want to change. But they were giving me all the signs that there were so many barriers in the way. And yeah. so the funny thing is with precision nutrition is when I actually picked up the manual, I went straight past the value chem mm -hmm. <laughs> I went straight, and I just looked for change. Because right. I've, I've done a lot of nutrition. And, you know, the, obviously the biochem stuff, the, there was a lot more for me to learn in there. And I went back and went through it. But I, I went straight through the textbook. I went straight to that behavioral change because that was the biggest thing that, that, that I knew was my biggest stumbling block. Now, mm -hmm. you, you talk about that kind of behavioral psychology and the coach, uh, the kind of coach-centered versus client-centered approach in your book. Yep. This is something I'd love you to explain because I think this is a, is a, as a concept would help so many coaches because this behavioral change, um, you know, I, I would say that nearly 90% of the problems that we have when we do any mentoring is there's a question that's asked and we'll go back to behavioral change. And as much as mm -hmm. everybody will expect it's going to be a nutrition or it's going to be a training, I will, well, your nutrition looks pretty good. Your training looks pretty good. We're actually going to come back to the client. Mm -hmm. So, this kind of coach centered client centered model that you kind of put together. Could you explain this to us? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is, this is going to be one of the biggest epiphanies and I think all career progress stems first on some kind of discussion about what the coach themselves needs to change. So in between their ears is the limiting factor, right? So it certainly was for me, you know, I think, you know, I'm going to share some language here in a minute about coach versus client centered, like what that could look like in a conversation. But first, I think we have to change our orientation. And that's, that's what this idea of coach versus client centered is. Now, a coach centered approach focuses on the coach, what they know, their knowledge, and uh, their desire to impart education on the client. Client-centered coaching is different. It's about the client. It's about this notion that the client is fundamentally the expert on their own human life and that this interplay between coach and client becomes really fundamental to appropriate change. So a coach-centered interaction may look like this. So someone walks up to me at the gym and is like, hey, you're in really great shape. I've been thinking about this one question. Maybe you can help me answer it what should I have after a workout? Like what kind of food or drink or whatever, what would help with my recovery? So now, I mean, I'm sure this happened to you about a 
billion times as it has me, you know, and most coaches who are in good shape and hanging around the gym, right? Mm -hmm. um, now a coach centered approach, remember it focuses on your knowledge, what you know, your expertise might say something like this. Well, you know, what happens after a workout or during a strength training workout, let's say, is, you know, you're stimulating muscle fibers, you're causing some micro trauma. Exactly. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, after that, you need to repair, right? So you've used some glycogen. So you want to replenish your carbohydrate stores. So you probably want a fast digesting carbohydrate. You probably also want a uh, fast absorbed protein, a complete protein source that can quickly take you from a negative protein balance to positive protein balance. Yep. So the best thing to eat after a workout would be a fast digesting protein carbohydrate drink, right? So that's a coach centered approach. Uh, notice you asked the client no questions. You basically gave a lecture and whether you did it in advanced scientific terms or very basic terms is irrelevant. Mm. What you did was a one way conversation. You might as well have been on a stage speaking to an audience, yeah. right? Um, which that's a totally separate kind of interaction, right? That's an appropriate one if you're on a stage and you have an audience, right? Now, a client-centered approach here would be, well, cool, I'm glad you asked me this question. Could I ask you a few questions first? And use that opportunity to find out what the person's goals are, what they're doing right now for post-workout nutrition. What do you, so an appropriate question might be, oh, that's a cool question. What do you like to eat after a workout? What do you have right now, right? Um, and, oh, I don't need anything for two hours. I heard that's best, you know? And then, oh, okay, whoa, well, all right. Now, now I understand where we're beginning. Or, hey, I, I always eat Big Macs after my workouts. You know, you, you wanna it's sort of like a detective, start looking for clues as to who this person is and what kind of advice might be appropriate because Yes, that shake idea might be really the, the next thing, or it might not be at all, right? That, that may not be an appropriate solution at all. And you'll never know. You'll never know unless you ask some questions. So the, that client-centered approach really puts the client at the center of the interaction. It, in practice, simply looks like asking a heck of a lot more questions than any expert is inclined to ask. So if you're a coach and you think you're pretty knowledgeable, it's going to be your default mode to lecture over inquire. Yeah. And uh, the client-centered approach dictates almost in the beginning a forced kind of asking of questions until you get in the habit of actually being really curious, you know? And then that curiosity leads this sort of dance between you and the client where you're like, ah, now I get where, who you are and where you're coming from. I'm thinking this might be an appropriate next step. How do you feel about it? And that's where we, you know, once you give the sort of uh, co-created advice, you know, the next sort of secret weapon here of coach or client-centered versus coach-centered is uh, this confidence testing that we talk about, right? So, I mean, I rarely have ever heard this in most, co most coaching interactions, but it's the most powerful thing we've ever used. And it's, okay, Mark, we came up with a, an option for you for your post-workout meal. Um, and I know we co-created it in dialogue, right? Now the question is, now I'm curious, on a scale of zero to 10, zero being there's no way in hell and 10 being, of course, a trained monkey could do this. Yep. How confident do you feel you can do this every day for the next two weeks? And this gives us a sense for whether that advice is doable in the context of a real human life, right? I mean, how often have we told a client to go do something and then failed to ask them whether they have any belief that they could actually do it, okay. right? Yeah. In the medical industry, you know, um, one of the biggest problems that conferences, hundreds of them annually are trying to solve is the non-compliance of prescription medication use. So uh, someone has a life-threatening illness, doctor prescribes life-saving medication, a magic pill, if you will, mm -hmm. and people only take it between 40 and 50% of the time, right? And that's the magic pill. We often joke in our field, people are just looking for the magic pill, course, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I submit that even if we had it, we would still have a coaching problem because they'd only take it four to five out of 10 times. 
So in the medical field, this is a thing, right? I mean, people are trying to solve it. Pharmaceutical industries are obviously incentivized to solve it because then they sell twice the medication, right? Um, but in this case, I, I often think, wouldn't it be interesting if doctors asked the same question? Hey, for your diabetes or heart disease or high cholesterol or whatever, sure, 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 sure. Here's, here's a medication. Now, before I prescribe this, I'm curious, how confident do you feel that you could take this pill once in the morning and once at night every day for the next two weeks? And if the person said, well, two out of 10, and the doctor prescribes it anyway, who's the idiot in that interaction? Yeah, you know what I mean? Uh, so this is why I think it's such a powerful way. I mean, it takes you know, 20 seconds to have that interaction. And it saves you lots of frustration as a coach, and it saves the client lots of frustration as a client because it tells us right off the bat how confident. Does someone think they can actually do this thing? Because if not, we need to make it simpler so that they think they can actually do it. You know, and, and so we don't have to have those annoying conversations. Hey, did you fill out your compliance grid? After two weeks, you see them again. And hey, how did your practice go that I gave you? Well, not so good, coach. Or that's even if they come back. Because sometimes they're so embarrassed they didn't do it that they don't even come back, right? So, and they, they I, I call it hiding under the desk, right? You give someone a call and they're hiding under the desk when the phone rings because they know it's you and they're going to have to give you the bad news. But we didn't have to have that interaction. If I would have asked you up front and you could have told me you don't think you could do it and then we could have come up with something else. So this is the core of this client-centered approach. And again, it starts in between the, the coach's ears right? It starts with a different frame or paradigm on what your job is, right? It's not to know all the stuff and then tell it to the client. It's something fundamentally different. If you love like acquiring knowledge and then sharing it in a unidirectional process, mm -hmm. become a stage speaker. That's the job for you. Learn stuff, go up on stage and speak or become a professor, mm -hmm. right? Get a big lecture hall full of students and lecture them. But if you want to be a coach, it's a different job. It is a dyna dynamic interaction with each individual person. So just know what your, your thing is and, and do that and put yourself in the appropriate situation for that. And with this, it's really interesting because, um, you know, you've, you've touched on this just now, but something I'll always look for in a coach is, is their ability to listen. Um, and like, you, as you've just said, the coach will speak at someone and right from the day they start the coaching process, it's, this is how we work. This is what we do. This is what we follow. And the client's like, uh, and they're almost taking backward steps before we even start. Mm -hmm. And then once you actually start to ask some questions, you know, it's not a bad thing. If someone's determining to you the pace that they can start the coaching process off at, right? That's right. Yep. You know, it, yeah, it, you know, I, I, you know, one of the things that helped me tremendously here is, is parenting, to be honest. You know, we have four children. Our oldest is 10. I'll just give you a simple example of how this could play out in a non-coaching context, right? So uh, I posted about this on social. You know, I think our daughter was six at the time. So it was four years ago. And she was asking me about thumbs. Like, dad, what are thumbs for? What good are thumbs, you know? <laughs> now, okay, coach-centered coach would give a lecture about the value of the opposable thumb. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I would talk about sort of anthropometrics and I would talk about anthropology and I would talk about our primate ancestors and I would give a full dissertation on how useful the thumb is, how the thumb evolved and it became you know, important in sort of the evolution of various species. That's a coach-centered approach. It's about me and what I know. I'm gonna sit you down for lecture time. I know, I'm, I know better now, right? So what I did instead is I said, let's find out. As I said, are you curious for real? Yes, let's find out. I have an idea. Let's tape your thumb down with tape and we'll spend the next three hours finding out what good a thumb is for. Oh, and that's what we did instead. And at the end of that little experiment, we untaped her thumb and I said, hey, what was it like not having a thumb? <laughs> what do you think thumbs are good for? You know, what did it help with? What didn't it help with? In this case, we let the client, the child in this case, mm -hmm. learn through experience, learn at their pace, 
Do you think the lesson was more foundational, was more received, was more understood when their thumb was taped and they had to live it? Or do you think it would have been better if I had just lectured, you know? Uh, we could probably share some facts later, which we ended up doing. As she got curious after the experiment, I was like, well, and hey, this is a thing in you know, the development of various species. And it became now super interesting because they had felt the applied experience of this. Mm -hmm. um, so this, this example is just so profound, but I mean, as a PhD, as a lecturer, as a stage speaker, it's one of the hardest things to remember to do. My first instinct when someone asks me a question is rush into the teaching space. Yeah, and most coaches actually fancy themselves teachers, don't they? That's what they would say a fundamental of their role is. Now, I'm not saying teaching is bad. I'm just saying that there's, a, there's often better and more effective ways to teach than lectures. Mm -hmm. And especially when it matters, right? Like if there's no, if the test is life, right? Not, you know, the exam that I'm going to have you write. Um, so anyway, it's just, it's, it's, it's a thing that I think applies, uh, the skill, this coaching skill, I think applies to parenting, le team leadership and coaching clients. It's the same exact skill. It, as you highlighted from everything I said, it's this listening skill. Mm -hmm. And that begins with the fundamental curiosity. And prior to that, I think you just have to train yourself to overcome your instincts to answer questions when they're asked. Really, yeah. I mean, that's it. Someone asked a question and my instinct is to uh, answer it. Yeah. But yeah. I have to overcome that somehow and instead get really curious. And eventually it becomes second nature. Now, I'd say 60, 70% of the time, my first thing is, oh, you asked that question. Hmm, that makes me curious. Yeah. I've got some questions for you. You know, and, and now often countered, people will counter this. I, I don't know if they're trying to disprove my point or whatever. They'll say, yeah, but sometimes you get clients who just want to be told what to do, right? They, okay. they, they hate what you're about to do to them, right? And my trick for that is so simple. For the clients who are inclined to want an answer rather than an experiential type of learning, you say something like this. That's a great question. And I have an answer for you. But before I answer it, I'd like to know your thoughts on it. So what does that do? Well, it gives them the confidence that you're not evading, that you're not not doing your job, right? I, I know the answer to this. And I'm happy to share it with you. But first, I want you to tell me something, answer a question, or tell me your thoughts on the answer, right? So I get their involvement. And then I make good on my promise. I go, oh, that's really interesting. That's exactly what I was going to say. Or I look at it slightly differently, right? So you actually have them involved in the process of answering their own questions. And again, it's this idea that, well, I have a client who just wants to be told what to do. That's no excuse for not following the client-centered model, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. If you understand that that's how your client is, you just tell them, I'm going to answer this. I have an answer for you. I'm going to give it after X. And I think based on what you've just said there, one of the, the things that comes up so many times is my client is not following their diet. And that was why I ended up at Precision Nutrition. I'm giving the diet, I'm giving the diet. And I'll never forget one day there was a, uh, uh, a mum of two children and she wasn't following her diet. She wasn't following her diet. Wasn't, and, and I just remember studying and I went into her and I said, is your diet the one that I've provided, the one that I've told you to do, is it something that you can follow? And she said, no. Mm -hmm. And I stopped and I went, oh, and I remember saying to her, what could you follow? Mm -hmm. And she went easily this, but without that bit. And I went, mm -hmm. well, let's start with that bit. And then we'll, right. we'll maybe add the other bit. Cause I think there's, there's this kind of, you must follow a specific amount of calories. You must follow a certain yes. amount of food. And, and I've, I've, you know, over the years, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but if we've got to get somewhere, the absolute perfection, you know, in, in terms of where you'd like somebody to be, it's an on the way journey. So maybe we, mm -hmm. we start with less and we work up to it rather than being so infatuated with hitting perfection on day one. 
Yeah, it's true. I mean, I, I, I love that. First of all, I want to comment on that. I mean, good on you for asking. And then uh, adjusting. I mean, this is a thing that a lot of coaches struggle with. Uh, the first question is important. Is this diet you're not following? I'm curious. Is it unfollowable? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, actually yeah. asking that question, right? That is a step for a lot of people. A lot of people may stop short of that and say, Hey, I got to drop this client because she's not doing what she's told. Right? So it's problem one. Okay, so we did the right thing. Hey, is this actually unfollowable? And she <laughs> says yes. And then you go, Okay, cool. I could drop this client now because I know it's followable. I have other clients following something very similar, or I can figure out what is followable for her. So that's the next right thing in this chain. And then the next right thing is, hey, okay, cool. Let's, let's do that. Let's adjust the approach. Um, you know, what I was hoping to provide when we started really looking at this and teaching this in the precision nutrition context was all that frustration in between. Like what if we could find out in the beginning so there wasn't weeks that have gone by with client frustration, coach frustration, right? So that's, I mean, I think that's super important. Um, you know, I think, um, yeah, we'll, we'll leave it there for now. I, I, I was going to go off on a tangent, but we can leave it there for now. But you actually, you actually covered this in your, in, in your book, actually. I think there was, a, there was a part in there which was looking deep, more, deeper at your question, questionnaires as well as, as to asking yes. those more. Um, and like you said, we, we could delve right into this, but, but we won't. I'd like to go off somewhere else if we, if we can as well. But asking yeah. more specific questions at the beginning would help you create more at the beginning of the coaching journey, right? Uh, for that's sure. exactly right. Yeah, for that's sure. exactly right. I don't, I don't want to send you off uh, unsure about whether this feels like something you can do. And I don't want you to leave feeling like scared that you can't do this and that we're going to have a difficult exchange in one week's time or two weeks time or whatever the case may be. You know, I, I want us to both feel pretty good about the probability of this working out right from the start. And that cannot happen without the kind of dialogue we're talking about without some coach curiosity, uh, without some sort of understanding that different clients will bring different levels of confidence to the table. You know, I, I, you know, I've taught this. If, if a client is deficient in vegetables and that's the big thing you see as an opportunity and they say, yeah, yeah, I think I should work on that. And you tell them 10 servings a day and they say, oh, that's a two out of 10. And you go, okay, five servings a day. And they're like, man, maybe five out of 10, mm -hmm. still too low. And you say two servings a day and they're like seven out of 10 and you want nine out of 10. And you say, oh, okay, well, you get down to one serving every other day or something. Uh, the really committed and impatient coach will be like, but that's not enough. That's not enough vegetables to force progress here. And if someone is only confident that they can do one vegetable every other day, then you are not getting much progress. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, that's not on the table right now. The progress then, like the physical progress, the progress then becomes building their confidence, right? If we start them at one every other day and they see that's not that big of a deal, and then we get up to one a day, and then we get up to three a day, now all of a sudden we're laying the groundwork that makes physical progress yeah. possible, right? Okay. And, uh, and this, again, it's, it's inside the coach's head. That's where the limiting factors are. We put it external. We put it on the client. These clients are making my life miserable, right? But it's actually often our own expectations. You know, I, uh, I do want to go down this path here because I see it in parenting, I see it in team leadership, and I see it in coaching clients. Um, we bring our own expectations to the table as a coach for others. We bring our impatience, we bring our triggers, we bring all this personal psychology to the table. And then we foist it on other people as if they just have to deal with it. You know what I mean? I want you to get results in 16 weeks. Well, have you asked whether I want that as the client? You know what I yeah, mean? Of course, of course. Or, you know, and I think there's this concept we have in coaching at PN called um, accepting the possibility of non-change. Yeah. So in in other words, yeah, yeah. You know, preparing your own heart and mind, if you will, for the idea that maybe this person in front of you won't ever change and somehow being okay with that without giving up on them, right? Mm -hmm. Just being okay that 
sometimes that's even enough. Like the interaction that someone cares about them and is helping them forward may be enough for now for that person, right? I mean, we've had clients who've gone through a year of precision nutrition coaching who did not have remarkable physical transformations. Maybe they lost eight or 10 pounds, right? And uh, they still say it was worth it because they got other things out of it, right? And so for us, it's just as coaches, it's this idea. And again, I think about it in parenting context, right? Sometimes I find myself rushing my children along, you know, oh, we're going to be late for such and such, right? And I'm putting all this pressure and anxiety into our relationship when the such and such thing that we were going to be late for was for them in the first place. And they didn't care if they were late or not. You know what I mean? (laughs) We do this all the time. This is sort of characteristic of us as leaders, as parents and as coaches. So it's just, again, how do we work on our own brain to say, is this their expectations or mine? Am I adding stress and tension and anxiety to this relationship that they've never asked for? They don't have those expectations of this you know, can I be more patient? Can I accept less progress as a coach, right? On my client's behalf, because they never asked for all that, right? And again, if you don't know them, then you won't know what they've asked for. And all you will be doing is projecting your own whatever. And in the hardcore training world, um, that's happened far too often, right? I mean, cl- coaches will fire clients because those clients are making them look bad. You've mm-hmm. heard this, right? Yeah, of course. Like, hey, I, I can't work with these clients who don't follow my advice. They make me look bad. So really what you're saying is that the most important thing here is your ego and your marketing, right? That's, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to collect testimonials to drive my marketing and uh, client desires be damned, right? And so again, that may be fine if you define that as your purpose. Mm-hmm. But if your purpose is actual coaching, it's it's insufficient. It's the wrong approach. Mm-hmm. No, I, I, I love that. And, and you've just touched on something which you said a few minutes ago, actually. And I wanted to kind of you head off on this direction because with that, we get to a point where it's like, is coaching your thing? Is it your job? Yeah. Because you mm-hmm. talk about this in the book as well. And it really made me stop and think because – There's nothing wrong with being a speaker. There's nothing wrong with being a writer. There's nothing wrong with being a coach, a trainer, a personal trainer. There's nothing wrong with being a body transformation coach. But I find there's a lot of fitness professionals that have this whole should be, must be mentality and end up very unfulfilled. And I, 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 I spend a lot of my time, I have come from the age of 23 redirecting myself. I've, I've done a lot of personal growth and development with myself over the years to navigate myself to a point where I can truly say I've never been happier, never been more fulfilled. Every coaching session I've done with my clients, I love, but I'm seeing a lot of coaches who are following a path that they feel they should and must do as opposed Mm -hmm. to what they truly is their passion. And, and interestingly, and I know I always do this when I read books, because if someone suggests something such as yourself, I will read the book and I read the unique Mm -hmm. qualities and I went and finished that last week. And it's a book that I've never been introduced to, even though I've read, studied Dan Kennedy's work. But identifying your own passion and finding that, that's something that you've talked a lot about. And mm-hmm. I'd love you to share your thoughts on that because I think there's a lot of fitness professionals who are a little bit lost. Yeah, completely. Yeah, I mean, that, that was really the crux of the book, you know, aside, you know, uh, yeah, fundamentally the book came about... Um, in 2017 when I sold my ownership of precision nutrition and I was, you know, I got lots of money uh, and I had lots of free time, you know, and, and and I said, Hey, what's, what's next. And this is an idea that I've had for a while now, man, it would be great to capture everything I think I've learned over the last 30 years. And I think the the core of everything that I've learned is this thing, you know, what you, what you talked about in your journey. And I've had a similar one, right? This idea of, am I even in the right place, right? I mean, when, when people are thinking about career, they, they often jump past that and go to what are the tools and tactics to assure my success, right? And there's plenty of that in the book. But 
before that, it's just, am I in the right place? Am I on the right bus or in the right airplane pointed at the right direction? Um, you know, I, I come from an immigrant family and this has always been my driving force. You know, I grew up seeing hard work. You know, my parents, the uncles, all the people around me, you know, blue collar folks with not much education, working two, three jobs. So it's in my, this is baked into who I am now that I was always going to work hard. I don't know how to do anything but, right? But I also got this perspective through education and exposure to different ideas that wouldn't it be cool if I'd done all that hard work towards something that was meaningful to me? You know, something that at the end of my life, my retirement, whatever, and that's why I have that little quote in the book, when I die or retire, dot, dot, dot. When I die or retire, I'd like to know that I directed all that hard effort at something that will have made a difference and made me feel great about it, right? Um, and so, you know, that's, that's where the book sort of the, the core of the book is, this idea um, of finding your purpose, using your unique abilities to serve it, and then setting up your values as your sort of, you know, parameters or, you know, sort of rail posts to keep you within what's important to you for a good life, right? So now I, I didn't come about this theoretically. I came about this very, very practically and concretely, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. You know, I have, I have the story in the book where, you know, PN was taking off. It was on fire. If you're an entrepreneur, you would have loved to have been me. You know what I mean? Like we're making lots of money. We have a tremendous industry reputation. We're making a big impact on lives. It's in the space that I said I wanted to be in. You know, I went to school for pre-med. I was supposed to go be a doctor. And then I stopped at the last minute and said, hey, now I want to do this nutrition and exercise thing. And people are, he, 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 what? You know, I, I remember someone saying to me, uh, that's a great idea. Skip med school, go do a master's in exercise science because I heard the exercise science factory is hiring, you know, yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and, that, and that was summed up very well, you know, the difficulty of that decision. Uh, there are no jobs waiting for you at the end of a master's in exercise science, right? But I, I did it anyway, but, and, and now I'm one of this tiny percent that's actually crushing it financially, helping people have a great business. But I was thinking of killing myself, you know, and, and if folks want the full context of that story, they can check it out in the book, but I was going through a really difficult period and I didn't know why, you know, we had just had our third child. So life was hectic on the home front, but what I come to learn after a lot of coaching and exposure to this kind of stuff I'm talking about right now was that I was living through a phase where I was, uh, working in my purpose, but not using any of my unique abilities, right? So I was running this company, doing a bunch of stuff I wasn't good at, a bunch of things that weren't important to me, you know, like to my soul. And so every day was this massive drudgery. And I was the owner of a big successful thing. And I didn't know what any of that meant. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like what... How do I even get out of this? So I, I wrote down a list. One is I, you know, I sell my shares in the company, right? Get free of this burden. Two is I just give my shares away. I'm so happy I didn't do that because a couple of years later we sold it for $200 million. Um, <laughs> so that would have been $100 million that I gave away to escape some pain. Uh, and the list continued. And the last item was drive off a bridge so the family can collect some insurance money. Um, and uh, I, I didn't have an earnest suicide attempt or anything like that. But the fact that I wrote it down and it's still in a notebook that I have to this day, mm. um, it, it made it clear that I had to do some work. And I met with my business partner who started the company, Phil, with, we met, um, got some counseling. But what emerged from it all was this process for identifying purpose, unique abilities and values. And I got it from different places, you know, like you said, Dan Sullivan is the guy who I learned the unique ability thing from, Sorry, you know, yeah, I said Dan Kennedy, he's marketing, isn't he? Yes, that's right. Um, and so, you know, I pulled these things together and then Phil and I did it on ourselves. 
So I, I still have my purpose, unique abilities and um, value statements posted on my wall. So I can look at them every single day and be reminded when I forget what I'm here to do. Um, and Phil did the same. And then we rolled it out across the entire organization. We thought, what better place could there be to work than a place where everyone's working towards the same purpose, but the person on the left to you and the right of you are using unique abilities that are different from yours. Right. So everyone's working in this. And I'll, and I'll define that because I think unique abilities is so crucial. It's the thing that you're world class at or could be. It's the thing that among that world classness you enjoy and you can see yourself doing for the rest of your life. And it's the thing that moves the needle on whatever your metrics of meaning are. Right. So it has to fulfill all three categories. So you, you can or, or will be world class at it. You have to love it. And it has to do something like when you use it, it makes you more money. It helps you reach more people or it helps the people that you reach, maybe not as many, but in a deeper way. So whatever you define meaning as. So that for me just became so crucial. And, and we have this exercise, as you know, in the book where you write down these quadrants, like, you know, how much of my time is spent in my unique abilities, right? So it's the thing I love and the thing that I'm great at. How much time is spent in the thing that I'm great at, but I don't love? How much time is spent in the thing that I uh, love, but I'm not great at? And how much time am I spending on things that I'm not great at and don't love? And when I wrote that list out, almost none of my time was being spent in that love and great at category, yeah. which is why I was so miserable at work all the time. And work was so dominant of my life at the time that it felt like my whole life, you know? And so this is what I love to help people with now. You know, the, the goal is never a hundred percent of your time and your unique abilities. Cause rarely will you ever achieve that. You still have to sometimes clean the bathrooms metaphorically, you know, but if 80% of your work day is spent in your unique abilities, that's going to be a good, good work environment for you. And then, you know, and then purpose is, is simply that thing that lights you on fire. And again, I, teach people how to start discovering that. And then values are just, again, what, what are these boundaries, right? And not just like, I won't lie or, you know, those kind of things, but what, what makes for a good life, you know? Um, for me, you know, long defined has been, you know, whatever the professional project I'm working on is. When I was with PN, it was, you know, furthering the PN's mission. Uh, it was also family, like quality time, with my family. Mm -hmm. um, and then the third was my own health and fitness. So those are my three values. And um, anything else not on that list was a no. And by defining them, it also put parameters around how much I'd be willing to work and not work, how much I'd be willing to spend in the gym and not spend in the gym. So it really is, is a way to define uh, the parameters of your life. And I think it's so critical to do. I think you have to also write it down and look at it because it seemed like some days I wake up and forget all of it. You know, I don't know if you ever have that experience, Mark, know. but you're like, you wake up, you sit down at your computer or you head to work at the, whether it's at a gym or at an event and you forget for a minute what you're supposed to be doing there. It's, you know, there's a lot of distractions and new ideas. Some, some of it is negative and some of it's really exciting and positive. Mm -hmm. You have to come back to, all right, wait, what is my purpose again? What are my unique abilities and what are my values? You know, uh, I, many projects have come across my desk that I think sound so cool. And then when I run them by the unique abilities filter, I'm like, <laughs> I have no reason to believe I would do this well. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It just sounds cool. That's it. Um, and it doesn't fit my values. All right. I ha no matter how cool it is, I have to let it go. But there's a lot of people with this essentially, and especially with this world, the social media world that we're in, you know, I remember, you know, when I first started personal training, Facebook wasn't there, the internet was hardly there. I had to travel mm -hmm. to Canada. I was used to, I, I did a lot of work with Charles Pollockin in the early days. Actually, that's yes. one of the ways I found, came across you, by the way. Right. Um, yes. Charles. I, um, yes. I, I, uh, Charles was a, a really important mentor for me, um, me in the early days as well. Uh, we, uh, we ended up on some speaking circuits together and, you know, Charles has a very polarizing legacy. Um, and, uh, all I can ever say is he was nothing but awesome and big brotherly to me. Did you know did, what you said then for me, 
One of the defining moments of my career was when he started Biosignature and I went to Spain to Santander and I sat at the front and, and you know, Christian Thibodeau was taking classes back then. And I mm -hmm. remember sitting, sitting at the front, I looked at Charles and I just was inspired by his energy. He was so, he, you could see through the color of his eyes that he knew what he was about, what he was doing, mm -hmm. what his purpose was. And, and at that point, there was a big moment in my life and I said, you need to know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And that was, and I didn't know what it was, this whole purpose, this whole values and a lot of the things that I've kind of learned a little more about in my career. But I think I mentioned Charles to you because this world now is so social media driven. There's a lot of people seeing so much and ending up deciding this purpose and this set of values, even if they call them a set of values, which are almost like they're living according to somebody else's. Yes. Yeah. That's a copying, uh, uh, what they think may be a path to success that, that isn't their path. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. And, and with that, what would, I mean, your thoughts, your experience, you know, in this, what would be two, two questions then for you? What would be someone's, what would be the quickest way to identify to somebody who's potentially doing that right now? Mm -hmm. And what would, what would be the, because, because to find my purpose and my vision and, and values, I mean, it took me more than half a day. You know, I, I spent yeah. I spent days doing this, and I think people go, "Okay, I've listened to John Berardi on the podcast. I know what my purpose is." And I said, "Yeah, it takes time." Well, one one is a story, and then one is a, a process, and uh, maybe I'll start with the process, then I'll tell the story. Um, the process is you're not going to figure it out on your own. That's uh, definitively, I promise you. I don't care how much meditation you do. I don't care how much you write in a little journal or notebook. Um, sitting alone in a quiet space is part of the solution, but you will never arrive at it alone. You need to ask the people around you. So again, in the book, there's a series of questions. You know, on the purpose side, it's we figure out through these questions what your superhero origin story, and, and you want to include your parents and the people who knew you when you were young, because a lot of our purpose is driven by experiences we had when we were young, either positive, positively directed or negative. So this thing happened and I ran away from something and that's become my purpose where this thing happened, which was so positive and that's become my purpose, right? So we need those people who knew us when we were younger. Um, and, and then when we start moving to unique abilities, now we start thinking about colleagues, coworkers, the people who love us, the people we trust. And in the book, we have those 10 questions, you know, and they're, 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 they feel broad at first, but when you start getting answers from five or 10 trusted people, your unique abilities come out so clearly. You're like, man, I would have never said that, but they are absolutely right. I mean, you have all these like good feeling, but holy shit moments, right? Um, and this is how you do it. You have to triangulate your own self-knowledge, good, bad, or neutral, and that of those closest to you. And you start, you know, um, it's like that story of, you know, I don't know, six or 10 guys standing around an elephant and they're blindfolded and each one is touching a different part of the elephant and trying to describe what it is that they they're feeling like, what is this object before you? Mm -hmm. And one person's touching the trunk. So it thinks it's a big boa constrictor snake. And, you know, another person's touching the tail. And uh, you only can know that it's an elephant when you combine the experiences and the felt of the, the all the people, right? Because you're blind, right? To all of the, the picture. And this is how I feel about this kind of stuff. You, you are one blindfolded individual touching the uh, left toenail of the elephant and trying to decide what kind of animal it is. Uh, if you try and do this alone, uh, when you do it with friends and the people who care about you, the picture emerges, you know, and you have a chance. So that's, that's what I recommend. And, you know, what we're looking for is what makes me tick, you know, what kinds of um, things do you rely on me for and count on me for? What do you think I'm world-class at or have the potential to be? Some of these kinds of questions. And again, I give them all in the book. And so the idea is reach out to those five or 10 people, mm -hmm. ask them to fill them out. When they come back, it's a wonderful experience because it's one of the most interesting um, little uh, times that you'll have in your career where people are literally telling you nothing but unqualified positivism, you know? Um, 
And then you'll be like, oh, this, this emerges a picture. And again, I share mine so you can see how I actually coded them into a set of work you know, responsibilities that I look at and say, oh yeah, this is what I'm really good at. Um, and I'll give a story now, and this is my wacky story. Uh, mm -hmm. So in, in the US, uh, whenever I go to a grocery store and I walk down the bread aisle, there's this one bread that stands out and it's called Dave's Killer Bread. Now, uh, I've never seen it in Canada or where I live primarily or anywhere else, but it's all over the US. Uh, so Dave's done great with his bread. Now, Dave's Killer Bread has a picture of Dave and he's, he's like a he's like a maybe 30 something year old guy with longish hair. It almost looks kind of like a mullet, maybe. Right. And he's got a guitar in his hand and he's muscular. So he's like uh, he's like the personal trainers who fold their arms in their or <laughs> lean over a bar to show off, <laughs> show off their biceps. He's doing it on a guitar, though. Right. So you got this yeah. long hair mullet guy playing a guitar with biceps visible on bread that is a little bit lower carb and a little bit higher protein than normal bread, right? So now I don't know Dave, I don't know his story. I don't even want to know it because I made up a story that I like better. <laughs> and here's what it is, right? Imagine there's, imagine you're Dave and you're sitting there in the world trying to figure out your purpose and your unique abilities and your place, right? And, and, and you're like, what do I like? And he's like, well, I like playing guitar, like rock music. I like lifting weights, I like muscles, and, uh, and I like eating healthy, right? I'm pretty good at baking. There's no career for me. I mean, really, if you think about it, what logical career is there for a guy who spends his time lifting weights, playing guitar, and baking, right? None, unless you're Dave and you're creative and you're like, wait, is there like an outside the box way of combining my uniqueness into a thing, right? And so Dave's killer bread gets born. He's like, I'm going to make it because there's got to be other people like me who like eating healthy and lifting weights and love bread. And so I'm going to make bread for them. Right. And now Dave has this killer company. Right. And that's even if, if someone knows the Dave story and it's different than that, don't social media me about it. I don't want to know. Because <laughs> it's, it's just, I, it's just I love living this fantasy. Right. Yeah, too right. But this is, this happens all the time. I remember being at a, a Luca Husavar is a friend of mine and he puts on this event um, at, every year. Um, and, and so I went and spoke at it this last year. Uh, he runs a really killer gym in the Pacific Northwest uh, of the USA. And um, I remember being on stage and then looking at all the other speakers. And I mean, Luca's a really interesting guy. He played pro basketball. Um, he comes from Slovenia. He, he's, he's his own character and he's a good friend of mine too. And everyone on stage, so he probably attracts characters too, but yeah. everyone on stage was so very different, but very successful. And I remember thinking like all these folks in the audience are going to look up here and they're going to try and pick someone to copy. And because they think one day that'll get them on this stage, but that couldn't be further from the truth because everyone up here is up here because they didn't copy anyone because they, they did the Dave's killer bread equivalent. Mm -hmm. They said, I'm into this thing and I'm going to become world-class and I'm going to bring it together with this, whatever nutrition or training or whatever thing. And I'm going to be the category of one, you know, the person who brings their own specialness to this field to create something that hasn't really been created before mm -hmm. that no one thought maybe should be created, but I did it anyway. And it worked out, you know, uh, I don't know if you know, Mark Fisher from Mark Fisher fitness, but he's gotten very well known for having a series of very unconventional exercise spaces in New York city. He caters to sort of the Broadway theater crowd. I mean, his classes, they wear, unicorn costumes and underwear for group exercise classes. Um, it's very wacky. It's very zany. It's very anti sort of alpha male fitness culture, uh, but it works for that particular group. And why, Oof. why, why was this a thing? Cause Mark comes from the theater and he comes from his Broadway background. Right. And so he brought that into the fitness industry and taught a whole new generation about what sort of inclusiveness looks like and what, um, 
different ways of showing up in the gym space could be. Um, and, and again, I'm not saying copy Mark or Dave or any of these, but the idea is the people you hear about, you learn about, that you want to emulate are the people who've discovered the, these things, purpose, unique abilities, values, and double down on them, yeah. who said, hey, there seems to be no place for what I'm doing here. Maybe I'll try it anyway. You know? What you've just said was amazing because I remember coming back from uh, my PS, PRCP level one uh, with Charles. And I was like, I played rugby, uh, rugby union in the UK for 20 years. And awesome. um, I, uh, I, Charles was teaching strength, strength, sports, strength, strength. And at the time it was you know, recognized in my, in my gym that I was working at. If you got polyquin level one, you'd move through your career. They're almost telling you that if you could emulate the polyquin brand, you'll progress in your career. Right. So I did level one, two, three, all the way up. And then I started training and you'll laugh because you're a Canadian and uh, they do play ice hockey in the UK. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know you'll yes. laugh at me, but 90% of them are Canadian anyway. Um, That's right. Coming across. But I trained the um, Nottingham Panthers, uh, which is an ice hockey team. Cut a long story short, I ended up in professional sport um, outside mm -hmm. of my PT job. And I stopped one day and I said, this isn't what you're supposed to be doing. Like, I, I didn't feel fulfilled. I, I followed mm -hmm. this educational route through a person that I was inspired by with the Polykin Institute with being Charles. And I had ended up training individual athletes, ice hockey players, rugby players. And then I stopped and I went back and I looked at myself and said, first and foremost, I train bodybuilding. Mm -hmm. second, of all, second of all, I read bodybuilding. Third That's thing, right. I, I read nutrition. And what was around me more than anything was what my purpose and passion truly was. And That's right. Then I went back to that and left the strength conditioning and sports side and suddenly went on this path, which originally began with, you know, uh, bodybuilding and physique development. But it was a, it was a defining moment where I just asked myself, am I on the right path? Um, mm -hmm. And I think, it, I mean, if you could say anything to, to, to fitness professionals now, how do you think they might know that they are trying to conform to an ideal and not necessarily living their purpose? Well, you know, one, one of the things comes right out of the story you just shared, which is uh, how we spend our time is the truest indication of what our priorities are. Yeah. You know, I had a friend message me recently and say, you know, hey, my, my newish business seems to be taking over my life. You know, I know he has a new son at home. I know family is a stated value of his, uh, but he finds himself working way more than spending time with family. Is there anything I should read or how, how do I fix this? And, you know, in the the question just becomes not uh, what should you read to fix this, but uh, what is it you're getting out of work that um, forces you to use your time there rather than where you want to be using it, you know? Uh, because all we have to do is look at how you spend your time to see what your priorities are, you know what I mean? And if you're spending your time on something that you say isn't your top priority, then we have a mismatch. Uh, and what you say your priority is, is simply not true. So that, then, you know, then if I'm working with someone, then what I do is I help them figure out what is, what is it about work that scratches an ego need or a purpose need or whatever the case may be, that's driving you to spend all your time there. And can we find some of that meaning and purpose and uh, specialness in your family life? so that you chase it there rather than in your work life. So that's the first one, time, right? You're like, hey, I'm, I'm doing this thing with sport, but I spend all my time on physique. Hmm, there's a mismatch there. And, that, and you may be okay with that mismatch. That may be a choice that you want to make, but you said it wasn't, right? So that, that's part one. You know, and I think that's a big part of it. Um, the second, this, this idea, am I on the right path is, um, you know, it goes back to this unique ability thing, right? Like if 80% of your time is spent on the things that you are world-class at, love doing and want to keep learning and keep getting better at, and um, it moves the needle when you spend time in it, that's the path. That's the path for you, you know? Um, the, and, and, and not just because it feels great, but that's a big part of it. Yeah. The other part is because there's no guarantee of career success. There's no switch you flip. It's not binary. Um, it's all probabilistic, 
right? If you're working in your unique abilities, on your purpose, within your value set, the probability of having success goes up, mm -hmm. right? Now you could be working on something that's not marketable or saleable in any way. So even though the probability goes up, you still might not achieve that success because it was too low to begin with, right? If the probability of success on selling a goofy gadget that no one wants is zero, and, but it's in your unique ability set and your purpose and values and it goes up to two, it's still not gonna sell the goofy gadget. You know what I mean? So we're talking about nudging things statistically in your favor, right? So, but this is, but this is the point. Why would we do all this work? Well, it's because one, you're gonna die one day and it will be great, er, if you will have spent that time working on something that was worth working on for you. And second of all, it increases the probability of you actually making it. So making a career out of this, making enough money to um, buy the things that you want, you know? And so that's, that's why we spend a lot of time on this. So if you are uh, doing these unique ability exercises and purpose exercises and values exercises, and what you're doing doesn't fit into any of them, we're sure that's probably not the right path for you. Um, the, at the same time, you still might be successful. You know, I, I know people who worked in finance and left to open a CrossFit gym, right? They were making a lot more money in finance. Of course, <laughs> you know what I mean? So if your metrics of success are how much money I'm making, uh, unique abilities, purpose, and values may, may not be, you know, the path to making the most money. Um, but see how it's kind of baked in. If one of your values is making the most money, then uh, we, can, we can sort of shape the path towards that, right? So this is, again, it's kind of a client-centered thing, right? It's using you as the expert of you and the people around you to figure out what this picture looks like and now doing some daily governance towards it. But do you know that, that for so many trainers, I think, you know, you talked a lot today about that tactics and I think a lot of people are looking for the, the next Facebook ad marketing campaign, the next uh, quickest new this to make that. And ultimately, it's something that I truly believe in because it changed my life is if you do spend time and if it takes a while to find it, the value in finding your purpose and mm -hmm. your path is, is, is it will make a, a lot of the tactics and strategies a lot easier to implement once yeah. you've got it. And, you know, I mean, if we're, if we're looking at your career, for example, in my career, uh, for example, for sort of instruction here, illustration, uh, the truth is you didn't spend 20 years uh, looking for your path and then start. You started while looking for your path. You do these things in parallel, right? They don't happen in series. Uh, no one is going to uh, wait 10 years, make no money, make no contribution to the world, have a major epiphany about who they are, and then show up with no skills, because yeah, right? yeah. <laughs> you have no skills because you've been on the bench, um, and crush it, right? You, you have to be building skills along the way, you have to be trial and erroring along the way. Uh, what I think can happen, though, is you can fast track this, you know, I think while you're just testing stuff out, if you're also doing these exercises, now you have like theory and practicality, and they're all sort of coming together, so that you're like, oh, yeah, this is what I think, you know, my values are. But I actually just tested them in the real world, mm. right? I mean, I, I often think, like, we we'll use the values as an example. Let's say um, career is one of your top values, like you want career progression and adventurousness, right? So th they both sound great. I'm adventurous and I'm career oriented. Okay. But I want to figure out for real which value is top for you, right? So let's pit them against each other. And I think this unique ability stuff, purpose stuff and value stuff, there has to be this tension. Let's make a contest, right? So let's say it's um, April and uh, you just got an offer to start a new job in June and it's right on the career path you wanted and you're really excited about it. Um, well, if career is your top priority, then you take it, right, obviously. But what if you had a trip planned, go around the world, June, July, August, right? And uh, you're really excited about that trip. You didn't know the job was coming. Which do you do? Do you take the trip or do you take the job? That's gonna tell me your top value, 
right? Both of them sound great on paper when they're not forced to choose, right? Which one do you choose? Now, that's just a theoretical exercise. Think about your life. Have you ever had to make a choice like that before? Which one did you choose, right? If you're playing the game of life while also doing this introspection and self-discovery, you'll get lots of examples of choices you really made rather than theoretical choices you wrote on a piece of paper. That helps give you clues as well, right? Love it, I love it. And, and that, that ultimately, at the end of the day, I think also around a lot of people, John, there's a lot of clues every day, but they're choosing not to listen. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of things that are happening. Now, I'm very conscious of time. There's one thing I'd love to ask you, and I want people to read your book because you talk a lot about reputation. But there was one bit in your book, which I love, which you, you described developing your reputation is to focus on a, being a consistent human being. And I just loved that, mm -hmm. that, that phrase. What do you mean? Yeah, that's, that's great. I, I, I'm curious I just though before love I, this. I love I, it. I'm curious before I answer why, what, <laughs> yeah, what, what resonated with you? Uh, what, what made that so intriguing for you? Because, I'll tell you why. Um, I'm, I'm deeply passionate about helping people be happy in themselves. Mm -hmm. And Ben, our friend, Ben Bukowski, um, he describes his children as, as little human beings. Mm -hmm. And the relationship of bringing your children into the world is to not just see them as children, but just see them as other human beings that are learning skills and behaviors. And remember being with Ben and around his children, understanding that as an idea. Um, and I, I find human behavior and the development of ourselves and the, the stress that the challenges that a lot of people live with spending time on your own, uh, your own human behavior and, and you as a human being and your contribution to this world as something I'm fascinated in because it's the change I've made in me and the change I've helped in others has transformed mm. my life. So when I see human being, um, it, it's my commitment to try and be, the best version of myself. So when you said consistent mm -hmm. being, it's yeah. that idea of continually improving ourselves and, and living the best life we possibly can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, that's great. I love that. Um, thanks for sharing that. For for me, you know, this this idea of consistency is fundamental to my core of, of who I am and has been since I was younger, even, even when I was making poor choices in life, you know? Mm -hmm. um, this idea, I, I mean, another word for it, people often banter about is integrity, right? What is integrity, right? I, I think people use that phrase wrong all the time. Uh, integrity is consistent with your own set of values, right? It's like, like you may have a different set of values and you say, John Berardi, you're lacking integrity. Yes. Uh, but that, that may not be true. I may just be inconsistent with your values <laughs> and there is nothing in the world that forces me to be consistent with your values. You know what I mean? So I might not be acting out of integrity. I may just be acting in a way that you don't like or that uh, doesn't fit with your moral standards. So for me, this idea of showing up the same way with your children or with your partner or with you know, your clients or with friends and family consistently is integrity, right? This idea that the John Berardi that you get on a podcast is no different than the John Berardi that you get when I turn the microphone off is no different than the one that you get when I spend time with the people that I care about. Um, that there's no show. There's, there's just me talking about the things that I know in the context that I do trying to be the best parent, partner, friends, you know, interview subject, you know, leader of team. And uh, as obvious as it sounds when I say all these things, I feel like people very rarely um, deeply practice this, you know? And not because they're trying to be deceptive, um, it's because they never understood the value and also because they feel like they have to show up as a different thing in different situations. You know, it, it, it goes back to the copying thing we talked about earlier. How do I have success in this field? Well, the crass answer is I have to stop being myself and start acting like the successful people that I watch, you know, exactly. and that, that's a form of non-integrity, right? You are not. Now, if yourself needs a lot of work, you know what I mean? It, like I, 
uh, I know lots of people who use this explanation as a uh, sort of permission for bad behavior. No, you don't understand. I'm just me. Well, no, no, don't be yourself. <laughs> you know what I mean? Be your best self, right? Work on yourself as we're talking about here so that you can manifest the best version of yourself and be really integral and consistent with that. And I think, again, this fits into the schema of reputation. Like how do you earn a great reputation in your field, right? There's lots of factors, but this is one of them. People know that the John Berardi that they're talking to is the same one that everyone else is getting. That, so they can trust that, they can rely on that, they can count on that, you know? And I, I had a beautiful experience that one, uh, one of the mentors for me from an early age was Mark Verstegen, who started Athletes Performance and Exos now. Um, you know, for those who don't know Mark, he's, he's really the guy who created the um, field of, you know, we'll call it high level sports performance, right? Like when you go and see modern day sports performance facilities, where they have like regeneration stations and where they have you know, therapists on staff and where they're feeding the athletes and where they have cutting edge metrics and, and uh, training equipments and technologies. Uh, Mark started that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he's still doing that. And he grew this business that's a $2 billion business now. So he's also had a tremendous amount of financial success. So anyway, our family spends the winter in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona, which is where Mark lives and where Exos is headquartered. And, um, and I did a little talk at their center the one day. And then a few days later, Mark and I went, uh, he's a pilot. And so we went for a little ride in his airplane. And, uh, and he paid me the greatest compliment, which was, you know, John, I can't, I just have to tell you, it's amazing to me that the John Berardi that the audience got the other day is the same exact guy that's sitting in this airplane with me. Like, you don't even change your tone, your temperament, your words, nothing. Like, you're the same guy in all scenarios. And people, he's like, people actually ask me that. Is, it, is he really like that? And the answer is yes. And I think Mark comment on, on it because it's one of the things I most admire about him. He talks about servant leadership, but I mean, I, I'll go for a walk, you know, with this guy. And if there's garbage on the sidewalk, he cleans it up. You know what I mean? He's a uh, guy's worth a couple hundred million dollars. And if the bathroom's dirty, he asks for a mop, you know? Uh, and that to me is this, again, I highly value it. So when someone who I see that characteristic in, says it about me it's it's a great honor mm -hmm. and uh, and again it's it's no surprise that we have mutual respect mm -hmm. that why our reputations are like the way that they are mm -hmm. because it's something that we intentionally foster you know i i hear people talk about lying not being yourself in all situations is a form of lying so i suspect it's a cornerstone value of yours and that's why you picked it out as well right mm -hmm. this mm -hmm. sort of situational integrity um and uh and it, it, it's really, you know, it's, it's, it's really important, I think. And, and I, don't, I don't, for one second, and you mentioned this as well, um, expect other people to conform, uh, to live according to my values. I, I, I don't, uh, you know, but, but I certainly um, make every effort to stay, uh, you know, whole to mine. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think that with the, the, the society we live in now, I mean, if, if, you're not, if you don't know you, I think that you will always find yourself being challenged by outside authorities to be something different. And mm. the greatest gift to you is that you can be you. Um, and and that's exactly a, what you said. Do you, do you know of the poet David White? No. Um, so I heard an interview with him recently, and um, he said this great thing, which I captured immediately. And it was, um, you know, I believe people's beliefs are the least interesting things about them. Uh, what makes an individual, a human, a soul, whatever, is how they attend to the things and the people that are not themselves. And I just, it just hit me so strong. And, and I think an explanation for those struggling with what that really means is this idea that your beliefs are malleable. Like if you have the same beliefs when you're 40 as you did when you were 20, that means you learned nothing that's an indication of lack of learning, mm. uh, not of some kind of fierce consistency. You know what I mean? 
beliefs are just what I think about things. And hopefully you will think differently about things with each passing decade of your life as you learn and have new experiences. And this brings us back to this, this work that we're talking about today, right? Because there's a presupposition that people will have that once they discover their unique abilities, their purpose and their values, that it's somehow locked in for life. And it's not. And this is what makes it difficult and confusing um, because you have to keep reevaluating over and over again as the seasons of your life change and say, all right, is that still true? So if you're lucky enough, if you do the work and you earn the ability to say, oh, I think this is my purpose, unique abilities and values. Uh, now it's sort of incumbent upon you to revisit it regularly and mm -hmm. say, as I learn, as my beliefs change, is this still what I want to work this towards? This is still true. Yeah, very true. You know, very true. And so it becomes this, uh, at the beginning of the journey, admittedly, it sounds intimidating. Gosh, I have so much work to do. And I still have to figure out what to write in the ad copy. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> exactly. For my, for my business and my marketing. Um, but for me, and I think for yourself, and I think for anyone who's on this particular journey, it is exciting. It doesn't feel like a lot of work to me. It feels exciting. It feels like, oh, wow, this is great. Now I can involve the people who care about me and myself to continue to explore this emergent person that I am, that I'm becoming. Uh, I can stay current. You know what I mean? I can keep my purpose and unique ability statements current with who I am and now and what I'm learning. You know, and, and there's external factors. You know, I, I wrote about it in the book, a good friend of mine, her uh, son just graduated high school, moved out. So now her sort of self-definition is evolving as she becomes an empty nester and a professional and, you know, these kinds of things. And I think, so there's going to be external things, right? And then the internal work that you've done that changes them, right? Uh, it's not static. It's not fixed, right? Like this David White said, you know, your beliefs are the least interesting thing about you, right? It's how you turn your attention to the things that aren't you and the people that aren't you that makes yourself. What a conversation. Do you know about five minutes ago, I was sitting here and I was starting to get lost in this conversation. I was like, that's where my inspiration finds itself when you just feel like, I could do this for another three hours. <laughs> and I'm very right. conscious of our, of our time. And also, you know, uh, th this topic it can go on and on and on, but I just think that you know throughout my life, and I'm sure you you'll agree with me, when I've worked on me and worked on my core values and worked on on, on what I want and my purpose, nothing bad has ever come of it. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. only, only good things have ever come as a result, and I think it's right. it's worth the work. It's worth the work. Yes, I um, I will say you know there there probably are moments of discomfort though. Yes. Right. I mean, there, there sometimes have to be these moments of staring the, let's say, gap between what you say your values are and the time that you're spending on things where you go, oh, man, this is dissonant, right? Like I'm singing this song, but these are the notes I'm hearing. Ah, <laughs> <sighs> okay, right? So I've had loads of those moments. So that is the cost. And that brings to get about a fundamental disruption, not of reality, but of your construct of reality in your brain right? And that disruption can feel bad. But if you're committed to the path, then only good things come of it, right? Like, cool. then you go, Oh, no, wait, this is great. I just discovered an inconsistency about what I say and what I do. Awesome. <laughs> I didn't know that yesterday. You know what I mean? I didn't know that about myself yesterday. And now I do. I can fix that, you know, and it's in the reputation section of the book. That's, that's where I talk about this idea of hunting feedback. It's the same thing. Like you want all the feedback, even if people call you bad names, because you're in control, right? Mm -hmm. When you discover what all the thoughts are about you and your work and whatever, then you can decide how to prioritize that. But if you're in the dark, you're in the dark. <laughs> you don't know, right? So this is so critical. And again, it, it, it early in my life was a pain point. I did want to hear negative feedback. Now I'm giddy when I get it. Yeah. Bring it on, all the feedback, the good, the bad, the neutral, um, because all of it uh, is the construction material for future me. Exactly, yeah, yeah. No, I love that, absolutely love that. Thank you. John, it's been an absolute pleasure. Um, and I know 
I mean, this has been one of the most enjoyable podcasts I've done for a, for a long time. Um, and uh, uh, very much on, a, on a, a lot of subjects that have helped shape my career as well. So I think there's a, there's a, there's a big connection uh, to me mm-hmm. with that especially. But I know that um, a lot of people listening to this would get huge, huge value from this. Now, your book, um, I actually have it here. So I'll do some PR for you. <laughs> Thank um, you, sir. Um, but could you just you know tell uh, the listeners how they find out about you, uh, your book, and and everything else that you're involved in? Yeah, totally. Yeah, so the book's called Change Maker, and the subtitle will help you know people decide if it's for them. It's basically how to turn your passion and for health and fitness into a powerful purpose and a wildly successful career. You know, again, I sold my shares in PN, which is what most people know me for back three years ago now. And, uh, and I sat down and I said, you know what, this for me and for the industry, it be, it be I so bold as to suggest that I might be giving the industry a gift. Um, I think I should capture everything I think I've learned over the last 30 years about growing a business, about growing a team, about finding your purpose in health and fitness, because I'm so lucky to have done it. You know, I, I, you know, aside from that time where I lost sight of who I was and what I should be doing, you know, the story I told earlier, I mean, the resolution of that was we hired people to take over all the things I wasn't good at and was having no fun doing. And then I got to focus on the things I was. And it actually helped the business in a tremendous way. Um, aside from that period, I've been so lucky to work in my purpose and unique abilities and values and also be handsomely rewarded financially and with the stories of the students we've educated and with the clients we've helped. Um, and so, you know, I thought, gosh, who's in a better position to share this than I am? I mean, not just because I'm so smart or successful, but because I have time, right? Like I. I sold the business. Now I'm sitting here hanging out with my family every day, also thinking about these lessons. So I wanted to capture everything I think that I've learned in in 30 years and and share it all um, as authentically and generously as possible. So that's where the book came from. And as we talked about before we started recording, I'm as proud of this, prouder than anything I've ever done. I mean, I think I've done good work too in, in other domains, you know? But this is really, I mean, it was a painstaking two years of putting this out because every day I would sit and go, what I wrote today, is it true? Is it real? Is it honest? Would the people who were living the experiences with me, would they say these are true, real, and honest? Um, And that's the kind of book I want to write because it's so easy when you sit down to write to actually kind of integrate what you think the world expects uh, what you think is popular with what you think, you know? And for me, it was like, mm, can I set aside what the world expects and what is popular and just say what's true, mm-hmm. you know? And, and so, so that's the book, you know? And that's, that's what I'd love for people to check out. I mean, it's so interesting that you can capture 30 years of experience in a book like this and then sell it on Amazon for 20 bucks. Isn't you know, but it- that's... <laughs> that's that's and that's what we're at nowadays and it's great because you know we launched this last november um so we're a bit less than a year into it um you know and, and also the reach that something like this could have you know a fifty thousand health and fitness professionals have already checked this book out there's only four hundred thousand in the world you know what i mean so after a year, year and a half, we'll have a quarter of all the working fitness professionals having read this thing, which is so amazing. Um, so anyway, I, I'm just super excited to get into everyone's hands. You know, I think there's probably people who don't work in the field who could benefit from it too. I thought but, that when I read it. Yeah, I thought that. Yeah, but I, I wrote this for the field. You know, so, so during the process, the editorial team was like, you know what, why don't we just make this a business book? You know, just broadly a successful business book. And I was like, I, I've struggled with that too, but these are my people. You know, I, I came from the, you know, you read the story in the intro. My life was saved by someone in this industry. I was mentored. I was taken out of a pretty bad lifestyle. Um, so I wrote this book for my people. You know, that's plain and simple. Uh, so anyway, you know, if, if there are folks out there who want to get started in this field, you have to read this. If you're in the field and you're just trying to figure out what's next, I, th- I think you'll get a lot out of it as well. Um, so, so that's change maker, you know, and again, I'm super excited to get it in everyone's hands. And for those who are 
curious about getting a little taste of it, if they pop over to the Changemaker Academy website, it's just changemakeracademy.com, we have a bunch of downloads, which include all the, uh, one of the free downloads is all the forms, worksheets, and scripts from the book. Mm -hmm. So you can download them before ever getting the book for free from the website, just to see what it's all about. Because as you know, this is partly a thing to read, but if you're just going to read this before you fall asleep at night in bed, you're not going to get all of the value from it. There's stuff to do, you know, the unique abilities exercises, there's coaching exercises, all this kind of stuff. So yeah, I mean, I won't go on and on, but I just love if you work in the field or one day hope to, I think this will bring you a lot of value and I'd love for you to check it out. No, and I, I, I will tell the listeners now that I've read it and, uh, you know, one of the first things I wanted to do was to uh, reach out to John and, and, and get him on to discuss it more and discuss you know, his journey and, and, and very much a lot of the stuff that you've covered in the book. So I thank you for giving your time up today, John. Um, and uh, I'm very grateful uh, to have finally met you. Yes, Mark. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And to everyone who's listened, thank you. Thanks for spending your time with us today. I hope it's brought you some value. Thank you. <laughs>